Thanks for having me out today. I have a, a unique talk that I'm excited about because I haven't really had the opportunity to share it as much as I'd like. Um, a lot of times my talks are geared and centered on corporate social responsibility, which is what he was just talking about. Um, who knows about corporate social responsibility and what that is? Um, so CSR is the relationship between a nonprofit entity, a for-profit entity, and the community, right? So I'm usually very focused on that. But today I, I have the unique opportunity to speak in front of you because my lovely wife and our founder wasn't able to be here today. And uh, I get to pick up her talk. <laughs> so I'm actually excited about that because I haven't really spoken on this before. Um, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about my childhood, though. Um, you know, it was my wife's dream. Sorry, I also got off the um, airplane sick on Thursday, so that wasn't, I haven't been sick in five years. Living vegan. <laughs> um, my wife's dream, Ellie's dream, was uh, from the time she was seven years old was to establish a gentle barn. And you know, there's not a lot of people out there that can say that they had their dream from seven years old and be able to say that they came through it and fulfilled it and, you know, it's a living, breathing thing now. So it's pretty impressive. But for me, it was very similar. Um, animals saved me as a child. I had a very abusive childhood. My stepfather was one of the most abusive people I've ever known. And he, um, he would take every opportunity he could to take advantage of the opportunity as a child to beat me up. And there were so many times and so many scenarios and so many situations where the animals saved me. Um, the one that I wanted to tell you about uh, is a, um, a horse, and her name was Gato. And if any of you know Spanish, that's the Spanish word for cat. And, um, and she was just like that. Um, if you know about cats, you know that they're somewhat stealth and they're somewhat protective and they're somewhat standoffish and they're somewhat, you know, it was just her. It was just the makeup of who she was. And my um, stepfather, you know, was getting worse and worse and more abusive. He was on lithium and all kinds of, of medications and it was just, it got to a point where it just wasn't safe anymore. And I was on the way out. I was going to be going back to California. This was in Baltimore. I was going to be going back to California to live with my father. Um, but in the meantime, this time, he meant business. And I ran away, and I ran to the stables. And when I got to the stables, I, he was chasing me. And I found the quickest hiding place I could possibly find. And I kind of dove into one of the stalls. And it, you know, it was one of those half doors, sort of like Dutch doors, where uh, the half on the top was open, but the bottom was closed. And so I closed it behind me, and, got, and this was Gato's stall. And Gato, um, I startled Gato when, she went, when I went in, but she really quickly realized what was happening. Um, she realized he was coming, and he blasted into the barn and screamed out, where are you? I'm going to find you, and if you don't come out, it's going to be worse kind of thing. And all the pigeons in the place flipped out and you know, took off, and it was a really scary moment. But I was kind of hiding down in the corner under, behind that door, and right when that happened, Gato went up in the air, kicked her feet, and came down over me and stood there. And there was no way he was thinking that there was an animal, I mean, that, there was, that I was underneath this crazy animal that just reared up in the air. But I was. And she saved me. And she protected me in that moment. And for a 15-year-old, I think I was 16 years old, for a 16-year-old boy in that scenario, it was life or death. So from that period on, I had a different connection with animals. I had been saved in different times in my life um, up until then, but never like that. That was so clear. And the minute that he left, she walked away and went and just started eating her food. But I knew that she was mothering me. So I, you know, years went by. I, I've always been connected to animals. I've always had them in my life in some way, shape, or form. <clears throat> but I, I wanted something more. And I had been doing a lot of volunteering and things like that where I was reaching out to different um, nonprofit organizations and things like that. But my stepdaughter uh, at the time had gone to volunteer over at the Gentle Barn. And she had begged me to come with her and go check it out. And 
Honestly, I was a little nervous to go because I'm really motivated to help animals. And I knew if I went there, I was probably going to be locked in, you know. And uh, But I went there, and it was as, amaz as amazing as I thought it was going to be. I walked in the door, uh, you know, in the gate. And when I walked back there, it was like I walked into a, my home. And, you know, this was 2001. The Gentle Barn had been started in, in 1999. And uh, I, I came in as a volunteer and started helping my, my stepdaughter and started getting involved. And I realized something about myself. I realized that all of that support, all of that amazing, all those amazing things that animals had done for me, I put to the wayside. And I let my experiences in my life somewhat take over. So I wasn't very kind. I wasn't very gentle. I was a salesman. I was very, you know, aggressive in sales. And I don't think I was horrible or anything, but I certainly let go of that part of my life. And getting involved with the Gentle Barn really meant something to me. And the Gentle Barn had some really amazing things. The Gentle Barn had uh, relationships with animals, but also relationships with children, which is something that I really wanted to express that that relationship with an animal and a child could really save that kid, could really give that kid an opportunity to grow in their life and to see what I had seen back then. Um, so if, if you don't know about the Gentle Barn, um, does any, anybody not know Gentle Barn? Who knows about the Gentle Barn? Okay, good. Well, the Gentle Barn um, is uh, an animal sanctuary. Uh, we have 180 animals rescued from abuse and neglect and slaughter. Um, we work with inner city at risk and special needs children. Um, and that's kind of like our during the week program. And then on, on the weekends, we're open to the public to come in to experience the animals. And it's just what it is. It's the gentle barn. So we're there hugging cows and, you know, lap turkeys, which is, you know, turkey coming and snuggling into your lap. And that's our Thanksgiving event is all about that. Um, we basically um, take the stories of the animals and the plight that they've gone through, the experiences that they've had, and connect it with the plight and story of, of children that are coming in. And when we connect those stories together, there's an amazing healing that happens. Because that kid realizes that if that animal has the same story I do, and has been able to heal from the bad experiences that they've gone through, well, so could I. And so that, that's been the sort of foundation to what we do. So we take animals, we rehabilitate them, we take children, we rehabilitate them with the animals. And they both help each other. And it's pretty amazing. And I, I, I venture to say that we're probably one of the only sanctuaries that is doing just that. There's riding, you know, places that bring, you know, children out to put them on a horse. You know, we don't believe in capture, cap, you know, taking a horse into captivity. So... <clears throat> The only time we'll ride a horse is if we have to take them back to the scene of the crime uh, to get them through something that they're suffering in before we retire them. Because we don't want them... Sorry. <coughs> we don't want the horses to hold on to an abuse. We want them to let it go before they retire. So it's the only time we do any kind of riding. So, and also in our program, we don't want to take a child who's in a dominant position as a gang member or whatever they are to be on a horse in a dominant position. We want them below the horse and learning from the horse and learning from that experience. So kids and animals. And uh, I will say, and I, I don't know if anybody here is running a, a sanctuary or... Um, the, the child aspect to what we do is something that really supports the ability to bring in funds for our organization. <clears throat> it's, it's definitely bringing in a whole separate line, uh, an avenue of income that normally you wouldn't have. So, you know, we're, we're going through our life, we're, we're running this, you know, this organization, things are good, things are bad, but we always talked about expanding. We didn't exactly know how it would happen um, until one day we got a phone call about a cow named Dudley. Who knows Dudley? Okay. Dudley um, is a steer who had gotten into an accident and had his foot severed. And when he had his foot severed, um, the rancher didn't know what to do. 
and kind of kept him in the pasture for a long time, uh, about 10 months, without really any professional care. Well, we were approached by someone who knew the man that had this cow and uh, were asked to get involved. And, you know, the kind of way that we work, you know, a lot of people ask us, you know, how do you choose which animals you work with and which animals you don't? And the answer to that is we work with the animals that cross our path. And if that animal is in Tennessee or that animal is in California, Oregon, wherever, we're going to go and try and support that animal because that animal crossed our path. So Dudley, uh, we, we went, and, and just so you know, uh, on our website you can find his story. Uh, we brought a filmmaker with us. And so we have about a 15-minute uh, movie that was made about him and his story. And, um, but it was an amazing experience. You know, here this, this animal was completely unable to walk in this pasture. We took him. We brought him to – it turned out that in, at University of Tennessee in Knoxville was the leading expert in amputations in cattle, um, which I don't think many people even think is something that exists out there as somebody who uh, <laughs> specializes in amputating, you know, cattle's feet. Um, but we found him. And ironically, in Tennessee. And so he was in Nashville, and they were in Knoxville. So we brought the um, Dudley to the, um, the university there, and, and they, we went through about a six-month period of time of, of healing him. And uh, now you can see Dudley. He's running in the pasture. I mean, he's just really amazing, an amazing guy. And I'm very, very close friends with him. And it's just been an amazing experience. But that was why we chose to open our second location in Tennessee. Um, and so uh, it's been an incredible experience to have two organizations now being a national organization, being able to use some of the things that we've known for the California location to really make this second location thrive. <coughs> um, it's been incredible. So when we heard about this cow named Redbox, um, who knows who Redbox is? Um, Redbox is a steer that looked identical to Dudley um, that uh, we got a, a phone call about um, he, from Oregon that was part of the FFA program. I assume you all know what FFA is, Future Farmers of America. Um, we were approached to step in and try and help him uh, not be slaughtered. Now, Redbox had a unique situation where he was in the school um, and was being loved by these kids. And the kids wrote an article in the Statesman Journal that this was the sweetest, kindest, most amazing cow I've ever seen. Uh, he's changed all of our lives. He's saved our, our relationships with some students. He's done all this amazing stuff. Um, so when we kill him, it's going to be really great because we're going to feed the, um, you know, through a food bank, we're going to feed the hungry. And, and we all thought, wow, you know, here's this cow that's changed the lives of these kids, and that cow's future is to be slaughtered and eaten. It didn't seem right. Not to mention the fact that he had all kinds of training, and, and he would have been a great first cow for us to potentially open a gentle barn here. <coughs> so we, we, we worked with, we tried to work with the school. Um, I, we tried to call. They wouldn't take our calls. And this is kind of leading me to the point of my talk with you today. We found out that the reason that they wouldn't take my calls when I came to Oregon, because they wouldn't talk to me. So I, I said, you know, are, I looked at my wife and I said, are we in this one? I mean, are we all the way in? You know, what are we doing here? And she said, yeah, you know, we, we're, we got to save this cow. I mean, he's an amazing being. He's got publicity about him that made him special and the kids love him and, you know, we can't let him die. So I, I went to the school, and the first experience I had was I went into the FFA classroom. Now, I don't know if any of you have had experiences with this kind of a, a group of people, but they're pretty militant, and they were very particular about the fact that this animal was going to be slaughtered. And I said, well, we're willing to offer anything. I mean, what do you need to not make this happen? And she said, there's nothing that you have. And I said... Well, I'm not going to give up that easily. Um, I'm going to go talk to the principal. So I, I went to talk to the principal. He wouldn't see me. He wouldn't take my calls. He wouldn't get involved at all. And then I found out why. The reason he wouldn't take my phone calls was because he had received 
hundreds of threatening hate mail calls, everything. They threatened his life. And he said, it put a really sour, bad taste in my mouth about vegan people. And I said, well, I mean, I'm not approaching you that way. I mean, you have to appreciate my email was very kind and, you know, open a dialogue and, you know, things like that. And he said, yeah, but the people before you ruined it. And I thought, wow, you know, that's how we're showing up. That's how we're showing up. We're showing up like the people that everybody's going to hate. And is there a place for that? Yeah, sure. Um, PETA, Merce for Animals, you know, all, all these companies, all these, you know, nonprofit organizations that are out there to, you know, put it in your face. But is that the time? You know, is that the place? Is that the message that we're trying to give? Um, so who's an activist? And who's vegan? Wow, that's so awesome. <laughs> I love that almost all of you have raised your hand. Um, we have a responsibility. We have a job. Our job living a compassionate life is to always be living a compassionate life and to always be showing people how compassionate we are. Now, is there a time and is there a place to protest? Well, heck yeah. I've done it. You know, I mean, circuses, you know, all kinds of stuff. But you can't go and talk to Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. You can't. And even if you could, what, what are you going to do? Take six elephants? I mean, you've got to stop people from going. So if you're going to go out there and shout from a bullhorn that that's, you know, don't go into this place because we think it's wrong, well, that's activism. That's what you've got to do. But if you've got a cow that's about to be slaughtered and you're trying to stop that process and you call with aggression and threats and negativity, I wonder how we're ever going to be received as value as valuable as as contributing so i guess my message today you know and and i want to talk a little bit more about about that compassionate side of things is that we have to learn to hold our tongues we have to learn to not be judgmental we have to know that the people who are around us who are not vegan they're learning, they're on their path. They're, you know, I, we have neighbors. I was just talking to, you know, I don't know if you know some of the different organizations here, I'm imagining you do, but I was talking to some of the different sanctuaries. They all came up to introduce themselves. And they were telling me, you know, we, we've got neighbors, they're so horrible to us. And, you know, we've got all these things going on that it's negative and it's dark and it's this and it's that. And I'm thinking, that's what you're bringing to VegFest? That's what you're bringing to the first time you're meeting me. You're just asking for more. We need to let that go. We need to bask in the light. You understand the magnitude of the growth that we've had over the last 10 years? I, went, I, I walked into the gentle barn and I walked out vegan. You know, I ate meat my whole life. I was born Orthodox Jewish. I, I was with family that, you know, brisket, chicken, you know, all this stuff was every day. I know what it's like. But I walked into that place and I, that was my aha moment. You know, you all know yours. And when I walked in and I walked out that way, it changed my life forever. Because I knew that it would never be okay again. It would never be okay again. And my first experience with it, my first, you know, I had the aha moment because I made friends with a chicken. Um, his name was Mr. Olafson. God damn that guy. God, it's so easy to be, you know, ignorance is bliss, right? But he, can't, he every time I came to the gentle barn, he would run up to me and he would spread his wings like this to pick, and like, who, what chicken does that? Spread his wings to pick him up. But if I didn't pick him up, he would peck at my legs until I did. And one day, um, after about a month, I went to the gentle barn and we couldn't find him. And I mean, every time I went in, he would come running. <clears throat> and to make a long story short, we soon figured out that he had, he was very good friends with the pigs. We had two very large um, farm pigs and he used to sleep on top of them. And apparently he rolled off and the pig crushed him. And, I mean, he weighed a thousand pounds, you know, or 1200 pounds. And um, 
I had never experienced loss like that before. I, I, my grandfather had passed away, but I was young. I had never experienced anyone dying that was my best friend, my friend. And it ruined me. And that moment, you know, that was it for me. And I went into a market. I won't tell you the name. No, I'm kidding. It was, uh, I went into, I think it was Ralph's. And when I went into Ralph's, the rotisserie was there. And that was the first time that I looked at chickens as body parts, as humans, as, I don't know, humans isn't the, the right word, but a animals, we're all animals. And I stood there and just wept, you know, for the loss of my friend who I, Ellie thought I was nuts. My wife thought I was nuts. We weren't married at the time. And she, um, I was just so angry by it, you know, that I was like, oh, just bury the chicken already, you know? You know, it's no big deal, you know? Let's just put him in the ground. But I was, I was hiding my feelings. I was, I was crushed. But I was on my path. And what I remember most about Ellie is she didn't judge me. You know, I didn't feel judged because I ate meat. I didn't feel judged because of my process. I didn't feel hated because of who I was or what I did. I was a good person. I was volunteering my time. I was picking up produce. I was helping clean up the barnyard for these animals that made a difference in the world. But I was still eating meat in the, in the beginning. But she never judged me. And I remember that so deeply now. These people that we come in contact with, and I mean, who sees it as their job and their mission in life to share this message? So we have to find that way. We have to find that balance. I mean, who's tried to convince their parents to be vegan? <laughs> I don't know. You know, the ones that laugh, you know, they kind of know. You know, you can't convince your parents to do a dang thing, you know. But you can put the message out there. But you're not going to hate them because of their choice and what they eat. We, we have to find a way to, to deliver the message. We, we talk about something in the industry uh, called compassion fatigue. Who's heard of that? Confa compassion fatigue is something very important because one of the things that happens in, in compassion fatigue is you have a rescuer. You have somebody who's so dedicated. But then what compassion fatigue does is it makes you start losing the care of what you're doing. And I mean, what, are, what good are we if we are vegan people, you know, out there and have no more compassion for what we're doing. And, and, and by the way, it's not something that you're gonna know about first. Someone else is gonna see it in you first. Um, so what happened with Redbox? So I, I connected with the principal finally, and I had several dialogues with him. And I said, we gotta save this cow. This cow, um, I, want, I, want to, I, want you to, I want you to know what I'm gonna offer you. I'm going to offer you $20,000, because we had a donor who was willing to help us. I'm going to offer you $20,000 to fix your greenhouse. They had a greenhouse that was basically falling down, and they really wanted to fix it. We're going to offer you $20,000 to fix your greenhouse. We're going to take this cow in and give him a life at the gentle barn that will open in Oregon for the rest of his life. And every year that he's alive, we'll donate twice as much food as you would have gotten from him to the food bank. All of your students can come and volunteer at the gentle barn and see him and meet him. The new ones can meet him, the old ones can come and see him. Please let this happen. So he said, I'm gonna go and take it to the kids. I appreciate the way you've approached me, but I can't make this decision. I've barely been involved with it. I will take it to the kids and let them decide. And I thought, well, this is done deal, right? What kid is going to vote to kill the animal? They're going to vote to give us the animal, right? $20,000. Future farmers of America, right? We want to make money for our animals, right? $20,000 for one cow, that's, for me, that's nothing. But for them, that's 10 times what they would get. But they said no. 
Why? Why would these students, 16 to 18 years old, choose to kill the cow? Well, they said that the reason that they chose that was because they wanted to go through with what they promised the community. They promised the community that they were going to feed the homeless shelter and that they were taking in this money and, and support from the community to do that. And I said, well, wait a minute. We're going to give the community 15 years, whatever, however long he lives, of food. How can you argue that? And basically it came down to the FFA. <coughs> the FFA decided that they couldn't allow the gentle barn or any other sanctuary to tarnish the good work they do teaching kids how to raise their meat. I feel like letting you sit in that for a minute. But it was devastating. And, and I think that a majority of it came down to timing. I think that they were so, they had such a bad taste in their mouth, um, the way that they were treated by the vegan community and activist community, that they just, they just didn't care anymore. They thought we were crazy. Why would you want this cow? Why do you care so much for this cow? Compassion fatigue. It's an incredible thing. It makes us lash out at the people who are trying to do the same work that we're doing or to people who are struggling in their lives to make better choices. How many people are really in their lives trying to have better health? You know, I think our planet is looking at that. I think we're all trying to figure it out. We all want to live longer. We all want to feel healthier. We all want to have those kinds of successes. And I think that, you know, these studies that are coming out, I mean, it causes cancer, you know? I mean, we, now we've got a study that shows that processed meat causes the same cancer as a cigarette. Wow, that's insane. I can't wait for the Surgeon General's uh, slap, you know, on there on the meat, right? Of Surgeon General's warning, this product, uh, you know, contains cancer as items or whatever. That's going to be an amazing moment. But they're going to start seeing that, you know, and they probably already are people who don't have the consciousness right now to make that choice or the will to make that choice. And we have to be there for them. We can't shame them. We can't should them. We can't convince them. You can't do it. You can show them a movie. You can show them a movie if they're willing to watch it. I took my son to the slaughterhouse. What do you think he thought of that? That was... You know, I go into, you know, these factory farms and, you know, I've seen, I've seen my share. I'm, if I never did it again, I'd, I'd be fine. But he started eating dairy. And I said, eat meat, but don't eat dairy. And, and he's like, well, I won't eat meat. And I said, well, why? Well, it's, it's too, it's too cruel. And I said, you have no idea. Let's go. And I took him to a, a dairy farm. But who's going to really do that? I mean, you don't have a lot of people out there that are going to do that. So we have to find the way. We have to find the way to be compassionate. So progress, right? We have to look at progress. We have to see the light. We have to see the work we've done. Who, who's done the work? You've, you guys are all activists back there. Have you, have you been out there? Have you done protests? Have you helped your friends cho cho you know, choose a vegan lifestyle? Have they done it? Have you basked in that? Have you sat there and, and looked at it and went, wow, I really made a great difference there. Look at the light, you know? 13 countries won't allow products to be tested on now. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, look at Israel. Israel's something like 10% vegan. Um, we have huge successes, huge successes. New Zealand uh, deemed that animals are sentient beings. I mean, that's progress. Are we jo joyous, joyous about it? Are we jumping for joy that look at the successes we've had? Because that's what brings more light. Focusing on light brings more light. Look at any of our great, you know, founding people in our, 
you know, Martin Luther King or, or Gandhi or all these people, they all say the same thing. Light brings light. Darkness does not bring light. I think that, you know, my life has been an amazing experience. You know, I've had the opportunity to run a sanctuary for 15 years. I took it from a little $12,000 a year organization in, in Tarzana, California, um, on a little half an acre, you know, farm, mm -hmm. and brought it to, you know, two locations and, uh, you know, multi-million dollar organization. And, but the thing about it is, is I, up until recently, I never looked at it like that. I never looked at the, wow, I was just caught in the moment of it. Caught in the, who am I going to turn vegan next? Because that's the underlying message in, in the gentle barn. So now, Redbox, right? Redbox didn't work. But the thing about Redbox is it lit a fire under our ass that we're going to open in Oregon. And that's going to be our third location. And we're going to tell his story. Because whether or not he's alive, he's still a being that's there. And we're able to share his message. And we're able to make change in the community. Um, our hope for the community is, is that we can be that light. That we can show other sanctuaries and other people doing the good work. And we're doing amazing work. That you can do it in a way that isn't shaming and isn't making somebody wrong for what they're doing, but showing them the path in which we're going and what we're doing and hoping that they make that choice. And, and I don't mind, of course, you know, the whole idea of, like I said, you know, show them a video, show them, you know, do the protest, you know, do all those things. But that person that approaches you at a protest and seems angry, I'll, t I'll tell you a quick story. We were approached by PETA um, very early on in my time at Gentle Barn. I think I'd been there for a year. And PETA said, uh, we're all about to go out and do a protest in front of Wolfgang Puck. And we're going to demand that they take veal off the menu. And we said, wow, we're in, you know. And we went over to the Wolf Wolfgang Puck near us in California, in Los Angeles area. And we parked in front. And we walked into the manager. And we said, hey, just so you know, just so you know, we're going to be here to protest veal being on the menu. And we thought, you know, we're going to get all resistance or whatever. She went, oh, my God, thank you so much. We hate that veal's on the menu. And I went, oh, my God, what an amazing person, right? So she said, if you need the bathroom or you need some water or whatever, come on in. And we're like, what just happened? So while we were out there, you know, all we were doing was taking a little card. And, and we said, um, if you agree with the fact that veal should be off the menu, please give this to your server. That's it. So, you know, people would walk by and we, you know, we had a little sign or whatever and they'd walk over and, and we'd give them the card and say, hey, you know, if you don't agree with uh, veal being on the menu, please give the server this card. And I swear to you, 90% of the people said I'm ordering double. I wouldn't have ordered veal, you know, when I was walking up, I didn't even have the idea I would order veal, but now I'm going to order it. And we were like, what? What just happened? And there was this man, he was walking by with his wife on his arm, and he had his two older daughters behind him. Um, and, and he said the same thing. He said, you know, I'm going to order double veal this time. And she looked back and she said, I'm so sorry, we don't even eat veal. I don't know what he's talking about. But I think it was in the delivery. I think it was us telling them what to do. And I think that they, they were just shutting down. I had to take Ellie home because... If any of you have ever known uh, my wife, um, there was one guy, he was as big as a tank. I'm a big guy, you know. And by the way, this this is a, a vegan <laughs> that's doing vegan for compassion, not for health. <laughs> well, I want to be healthy, and I'm, I don't drink coffee. I, I take uh, algae every day, I, you know, all those different things. But come on. You know, but I'm a big guy, right? This guy was, you know, he was a tank. And, you know, she said, Ellie Wick walked up to him and said, you know, hey, you know, we're here to, you know, protest feel, you know, whatever. And he said, I'm going to order double and, and, you know, screw you for being out here and telling us what to do. And she said, well, happy heart attack, you know, <laughs> and, and he just kept walking off. I said, you need to go home, <laughs> you know, 
Anyway, um, I, I, I want to just end with, with something that I found. Um, that inside every moment, progress seems so slow. But, and if, if any of you know this already, progress is happening and we'll have a gentle world in our lifetime if we believe in it. Progress and finding a gentle way, like the gentle barn. Progress will be won by showing the light, your light to the world. Just the fact that you live in an apartment or a house in a community and you bring that light into that community, into that townhouse, into that you know, apartment complex, just the fact that you're there living a compassionate vegan lifestyle changes things, even if you can't see it. It's what I believe. Thank you. Um, I'm certainly here for any kind of questions in any area about sanctuaries, about running one, about lifestyle, about anything. Yes, you in the front. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. How, how does all the funding happen? <laughs> Thank you. The question was about funding and how we raise money for the organization. Um, <laughs> work your butt off. Um, we, we work very hard to cover a lot of different areas where funding can come in. We write grants. Um, we work with family foundations, which you have to find. Um, we have $5 donations um, that matter um, because, you know, the, the, the big saying, right, is not to have all of your pretend eggs in, a, in one basket, right? So you want to have as many donors as you possibly can instead of one big donor, although the big donors are nice. Um, so we do small things, memberships and, you know, reoccurring monthly donations. And uh, we're open to the public on the weekend so people can come out and, and you know, make a donation to come in. Um, so many different ways. I haven't. Um, I've spoken with many of them, um, actually several times. Uh, Lighthouse, um, who I guess had, had gone through some issues um, recently, but they seem like they're doing a, a okay now. Um, has, we've been talking a lot. They were part of my introduction to the, the Red Box uh, scenario. Um, our goal in coming into Portland is to, uh, or into Oregon, wherever we end up, hopefully 45 minutes or so, you know, away from, or within 45 minutes of Portland, um, is to enhance the, the whole, you know, sanctuary community. Um, so I will be, I will be going and, and meeting with them. No, no, I wasn't saying that they didn't reach out to children. I was saying in the way that we did it, um, that we're taking the stories of the animals and connecting them with the story of stories of the ch children, specifically in inner city at risk and special needs. Um, the, the different organizations that I've met here, and they're doing amazing work, and I don't mean to take away from them at all, have field trips and you know uh, tours and, t and showing children the animals and things like that, for sure, for sure. But I haven't met anyone that does the work the, the way that we do it. Unless you know someone, I'd be more than happy to hear it. I, I just I haven't met them yet. But we want to find them. What well, did that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, OK, cool. That's a, that's a very good question, yeah. Right. Well, um, so the questions, um, did anybody hear the question? 
Uh, the, que the question was um, how we find a location and size and what's important. I'll tell you this. Um, in California, uh, we made a mistake. Uh, we got too big, too fast. And um, not too fast, but just we got too big, bigger than our model. Our model is really only supposed to be, you know, 20, 30 animals that, you know, enough, enough of each species of animals so that we can do our work. Um, you know, having 26 horses, you know, is a, is a huge undertaking. Having, you know, 50 cows is a big deal. Do we need 50 cows to do our work? Of course not. You know, they crossed our path. We saved them. <clears throat> um, the answer to your question is the way that we did it in Tennessee, uh, so our second location, uh, was the right way. Uh, it's 12 acres. Um, we probably won't use all of it, um, maybe eventually. Um, we have, um, I think, 18 animals now there. Um, but it's running just as strong and just as well as the California location with 150 animals. Um, we did. Um, so we have a 15 acre property um, about 10 minutes up the road uh, where we use that for our um, quarantine and we also use that for overage in you know quantity of animals. <clears throat> um, but like I said, I mean, our model is to not be that big. You could have a gentle barn of your own with a few animals that you take into schools. I mean, the, the, the teaching compassion, teaching, you know, humane, any kind of humane education, what do you need, a chicken? You know, um, our thing is hugging a cow, so we definitely want to have that. But at the gentle barn's main property, um, and we have more horses than we probably should, just in our work, but on the gentle barn's main property, um, I think we have six cows on on that property, and that's it. And we have 500 people that'll come in on a on a Saturday. I mean, on a Sunday there. How big is the property? Six acres. Six acres, and you have 15 acres. Right, but people don't go up to the 15 acre one unless they're doing a private tour. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead. Nope, we don't. We don't say that. Um, that's, I guess, what I'm talking about. We we've tried to be a petting zoo, for lack of better explanation. We want people to come there and meet their meat. We want them to come and show up and learn about the animals and ask questions and love them on their path and their journey. Um, we don't. We don't put things out there that say. Um, come visit the gentle barn and learn how to be a vegan. You know, we don't we don't do that. Um, when we're when they're there, we'll smack them around a little bit. But <clears throat> but we really we're we're trying to come from a a a, a path of kindness and that they don't know. I, I didn't know. I didn't know. What if I walked into the gentle barn and Ellie said, you know, oh, you're a fucking meat eater. Get the hell out of you know. Do you see? A, we had a volunteer one time that slapped our, our uh, one of our pigs, Susie Q, on the butt and went, "There's your bacon," you know. We're going, "Whoa, what happened?" You know, and but people don't react well to that, you know. And not to mention the fact that I didn't like that he hit our pig, but you know, he was he was he was an activist and he was going to show those people that that they couldn't leave that this place without being a vegan, you know. And uh, what does Peter's study show? Twelve. 12 different experiences before someone will make that kind of a choice. You know, maybe we're step one. You know, maybe we're step six. I don't know. We try and handle as many uh, as we can in our place. So they come in and they, they hear me talk when they walk in, unless I'm here. Um, they hear me talk when I walk in, when they walk in, um, and I talk about a, living a compassionate life. Um, they hear Ellie talk in the amphitheater about, you know, if you'd like to find out more about choosing a plant-based diet, we have these papers here for you. Um, they can buy forks over knives in the store. They can hug a cow. They can give a pig a tummy rub. They can, you know, all those things. So we're hoping that they're getting, you know, a number of those experiences when they walk in the door. But we might not be the last one. Go ahead.
Well, I want to tell you, thank you for your, your question. Um, did everybody hear his question? Yeah. Um, I want to tell you that, that we have very few experiences with children who come to the gentle barn um, that don't work. So we, we've had hardened, you know, I'm, I'm talking about kids who have killed people. You know, I mean, they've come out to the gentle barn. They're, they're incarcerated because they, you know, did whatever they did. Um, you know, and, and they walk in like this, you know, and, and after a half an hour, they, uh, and you know, they, they walk in like that, right? They walk in with their, their pants down and they're doing this kind of thing, right? By the end of the thing, they're holding a chicken and running with their pants up. And <laughs> I can tell you that animals, it happened to me, animals can change you. And they change these kids. They change them on the spot. And it's amazing to watch. It's amazing to watch. And I, I'm, try, I'm going to try and work with some of the uh, sanctuaries to adopt more of that into the... Because those kids are our advocates. They, go, they get out of there and they go into South Central Los Angeles and they tell their friends, you know, oh, are you going to eat that? Uh, it's unbelievable. We, we do a Christmas event every year, uh, five years now, um, to give something back to the community of children that come to the Gentle Barn from South Central Los Angeles. Everybody knows South Central? So not the place you want to hang out at night, right? And, and these kids are living in, in Watts. They're living in uh, the projects. They, they have nothing. They have nothing. And we go down there, and we bring Christmas to them. We bring the holiday to them, whatever. And you should hear what they say. You should hear what they say. They, they're, they're so passionate about it. And they are the ones that are going to make the change. It's hard to change an adult. It's hard. It's it's pretty dang easy to change a kid. Please. Oh. Uh, he's uh, just, just. Go ahead. You want me to explain PETA? Um, <laughs> I, I'm very close with PETA. Um, I, um, I think that there's three ways. You know, I think there's education, I think that there's activism, and I think that there's legislation. Um, you know, uh, some people believe the Malcolm X way is the way to go. You know, I don't think Malcolm X had the same impact that Martin Luther King had. Um, but they believe in an aggressive, um, in your face, uh, and, and that's a publicity stunt, right? Because you know that that's going to get out there. And yeah, I mean, it just, but that's what I'm saying. And, I, and I'm not trying to down PETA because I think that they do, do some good things, um, a lot of good things. But that style is what I'm not for. I'm for a compassionate, we're compassionate people. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we choose the lifestyle that we're doing it. And I can guarantee you most of the people in this room aren't doing it because of their health. You know, we're doing it because we love animals. And, and humans are animals. And they're the stupidest animals out there. We're making all kinds of ridiculous choices. But, but if you see the light, if you see the way, we have to act on that. And we have to do it in, in a gentle, compassionate way. And, and I, I think PETA, you know, I think PETA's got a place in our, in our world. But um, I think some of the choices that they make aren't, aren't, aren't the right ones. But I think that they make a lot of good ones, too. I, you know, we could spend probably a couple hours on PETA, you know. I mean, I, I think that it also depends on what part of the world you're in, you know. I mean, there's so many different members of PETA that are doing things on their own and, you know, representing in the way that they represent. And, you know, did that come from corporate? I don't even know, you know. Maybe it came from some activist, you know. I, I don't know. 
I like some of the stuff that they do though with like Alicia Silverstone and and some of those celebrities and you know doing those naked you know photos. I mean, I think our society really responds to that kind of stuff. You know, and their starter grits. We give their starter kits out all the time. I love their starter kits. So that's what I'm saying. I, I think that they have a style about them that you know that's probably 20% of what they do that's really negative. Um, and that's their choice, you know, but I think a, a solid 75, 80% of what they're doing is really impactful, especially in the school systems. I like your comment about, you said, well, I take whatever 12 exposures or times that someone will, they'll have their aha moment. Well, that's a, that's a PETA th a thing, yeah. PTSD um, shows up in a lot of ways. Um, my daughter, um, I, I have, uh, we, Ellie and I have three kids, uh, one from each of our past marriages and then one together. I wouldn't show some of those things to my 10-year-old. She knows. I mean, she believe me, she knows. Um, but I wouldn't show it to her. I mean, I've seen it in person. Um, and by the way, once you see it in person, it's take a video and throw that out the, you know, but you're right, you're right. Um, however, if it had been 10 times that they'd been exposed to something and then that kind of a, a thing comes in and it just jogs them, you know, that can happen too, you know. Um, we, you can watch any of the video, any kid could watch our videos, you know. I mean, there might be some sad times and things like that, but we don't put things out there that are aggressive. Um, you know, the, the karma's reunion, karma is a, a cow that I rescued from the backyard butcher. And uh, I don't know if you know about the backyard butcher in LA that we dealt with, but you know, we ended up, he went to jail for a couple of years and he was doing some crazy stuff. But this uh, cow, um, she uh, was separated from her calf and we didn't know, and she was screaming and we ended up, but karma's reunions on our YouTube and all of a sudden it's at two and a half million views, you know, because it's not in a way that is offensive. It's a way that people can learn and hear. Sorry, I, I know that you had something else. Oh, I was just curious. Um, I do know who your fan was because I follow them and you. Yeah, and, thanks. Um, like you said, you, you can hug them and touch them. So is that something that you would have done to you, debutted, or do you dehorn them? Because no, he, he did not have horns. Dudley? Right. Dudley did not have horns. But for it, people to be able to hug. Oh, well, I hug my horned cows all the time. So I hug my... Oh no, I hug my horny cows. <laughs> we have uh, t 20, 20 horned cows, and you can hug any one of them. And you let the public hug them? On a private tour. Not in our, in our, in our open to the public Sunday area. We, no horns. Yeah, that's not a, gorded by a cow because he wants to play with you. Yeah. <laughs> we, have a, we have a cow, um, are we okay on time? Okay. Uh, we just have a few more minutes. Um, we have a cow uh, that's three thousand, probably three thousand pounds, and uh, his thing is to play with Ellie and run after her. And you know, you should—you never saw her run faster. But anyway, but he doesn't have any horns. In the Midwest? Yeah. Sure. Like where? Um, like Chicago area. Um, I think there's maybe one in Wisconsin. But we actually have an offer of land in Wisconsin where we've been looking. Yeah. Um, I you're right. I think climate plays a lot in that. Uh, it's so cold. Um, you know, you'd, you'd pretty much be almost closed down for four or five months of the year. I think that's been a little scary for people to start a sanctuary. Right. Uh, we've been we've been dealing with a woman who uh, wanted to just give us her place, and it was actually in pretty good location, but we're we just don't know it. You know, we have to go learn it. Um, but uh, we we ended up in Tennessee first. But but you're right. I I think that there's um, there's definite need there, and uh, our our intention is to open 50 states. So we're trying. Last question. Yes. Yes. My question is, how do you bring folks who may be like 
ex-vegans or who have fallen out of uh, the vegan lifestyle or diet or um, following, um, how do you bring them back to a compassionate place and have them reconnect with uh, what made them become vegan in the first place? Well, that, that's a really good question. Um, did everybody hear his question? Um, how, to, how to bring a vegan who's gone kind of off track back to being a vegan? Um, first of all, I, I would say we have a lot. We deal with that a lot. Um, and typically, it's someone who health-wise didn't do well. Um, is that your experience also? You know, oh, my doctor said that, you know, I'm not doing well because I needed all this iron and, you know, whatever. And, and typically, it's, it's education. You know, typically, people are really lacking in knowledge as to how to get all of those proteins and you know, iron and different things like that. That's one, one version of it. So we work with them to understand it better. And also, you know, I don't know if you all know this, but uh, Sun Chlorella is one of our really great sponsors. If you're not taking a chlorella or an algae product, get on one if you're vegan. The, the chlorella products have B vitamin complexes naturally, and uh, they, they work really well with, you know, sustainability in your body when you're vegan. Um, the other thing is, is that I think that um, years ago, there weren't a lot of very good options to eat. Um, that obviously has changed dramatically. Um, so I would say to some of the people, I, you know, you've got to find out what their reason is. But a lot of times it's because they can't find things that they like. Cheese, you know, things like that. I mean, chow cheese. Who's doing chow cheese? You guys do chow cheese? Heidi Ho? Heidi Ho? Um, love Heidi. Um, I'm a fan. <laughs> what did you say? Heidi Ho? Um, if you haven't tried Heidi uh, Ho, it's, she, they're here. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, well. Go eat more, um, but definitely uh, there, there's so many uh, amazing um, you know options now. I think that that had a lot to do with some of the people who have come and said, you know, I used to be vegan, you know, 30 years ago, and you know, probably for about 20 years, but then I, you know, I wasn't feeling well, and I kind of couldn't find things I like to eat and left it, and you know, whatever. I think I hear that a lot. Okay, last one. Are we okay? by uh, the sales guy that came into my work when I was an ex vegan. I didn't know how to respond to it, but he said, he said his doctor said he had some sort of like intestinal issue where he couldn't. That's bullshit. Sorry. It's bullshit. It's bullshit, and, and you know, okay, you used to be compassionate. Is that, was that what you're saying? You used to be compassionate? So you're willing to sacrifice somebody else's life? Uh, the way he explained it to me was that uh, the bacteria in his system went. Enzymes. I don't know. You know, there's a thousand different. I'm sorry, Doc. Uh, I'm not going to eat animals, so you got to help me figure something else out. You know, I mean, that's just such a cop out. It really is. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's so many different. And, and that person, and I and I have to end, but that person needs to go and and sit with a nutritionist and sit with a natural foodie. You know, and you know, learn the right way to eat because that person probably created that problem within himself because he didn't do the right things when he was eating. You know. But yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, so you're going with a doctor who's telling you not to be compassionate and telling you that the bacteria in your stomach is going to be better if you eat meat, mm, you know. Yeah, I mean, cancer in meat is supported by science. I, I can't tell you how much I love this. Um, thank you so much for all your questions. It was really fun. I really appreciate it. It took my mind off of being sick for a minute. Um, just really appreciate you all. Thank you so much.